When the Greek writer, historian, and part-time mercenary Xenophon told the story of 10,000 Greek soldiers desperately trying to return home from their failed mission to back a claimant to the Achaemenid Persian throne, only to have said claimant killed in the climactic battle, the point of his story is about the epic adventure, the dangers they narrowly escaped on their way home. But, being a historian, he couldn't help himself but to notice some of the interesting features he and his men see along their thousand-mile march back home. At some point, he and his men camp next to the ruins of a great city, which he calls Mespila. He writes in the Anabasis, quote, From this place they marched one stage, six parasangs, to a great stronghold, deserted and lying in ruins. The name of this city was Mespila, and it was once inhabited by the Medes. The foundation of its walls was made of polished stone full of shells, and was 50 feet in breadth and 50 in height. Upon this foundation was built a wall of brick, 50 feet in breadth and 100 in height, and the circuit of this wall was six parasangs." End quote. What neither Xenophon, nor his men, nor even the locals knew, is that this city called Mespila, which he says was inhabited by the Medes, and besides which he and his men were now camping, was actually the ruins of the city of Nineveh, capital of the great Neo-Assyrian Empire, which ruled over all of Mesopotamia just a couple hundred years earlier. To Xenophon, a learned man of classical Greece, Assyria was already so ancient that it, and all of its accomplishments, had already been long forgotten. And while he describes the city as being inhabited by the Medes, in reality it was actually destroyed by the Medes, a perfect example of the distortions of history. Just imagine how many great empires and petty kingdoms have risen, fallen, and been forgotten in the many thousands of years of human history. It was really only with the advent of modern archaeology in the late 19th century that some of these civilizations began to be rediscovered. And so it is, oddly enough, in Elden Ring. The lands between are littered with the ruins of civilizations long forgotten, only obliquely referred to in obscure texts or hidden iconography. And it's up to the archaeologists among us to rediscover these societies and piece together their story, even, or perhaps especially, the ones that are, like ancient Nineveh, hiding in plain sight. From the moment we arrive in the Lands Between, at the Chapel of Anticipation, reaching Landell, the golden city built at the foot of the Erd Tree, is the primary objective of our quest as a lowly tarnished. It's the basis of the accord we make with Melina, it structures our objective to acquire two great runes and the two halves of the Dectus Medallion, and it's an omnipresent reference point for our adventure. So it's more than a little odd then that when we do finally get there, instead of triumphantly striding through the front gates, we sneak in through the side door. It's easy to forget as we stride through the perpetually autumnal beauty of the Altus Plateau that our entry point into the city proper is a long forgotten rampart, adorned with saint statues and guarded by a single draconic tree sentinel. It's not as if there isn't a main entrance to the city, in fact we rode right past it on our way in. The city's main gate, towering over the surrounding terrain, marked with the characteristic Erd tree relief and adorned with the full panoply of Landell's military might, is, curiously, unguarded. The main gate of the city seems totally forgotten, an afterthought, and only a scattered few wandering nobles drift listlessly nearby. Perhaps the reason we didn't use it, and the reason it's not even guarded, is because it leads to, well, nowhere. It leads to an abyss, a chasm. How could this be? What is the basis for this nonsensical city planning? wherein the main road and entrance to the city leads to a chasm of nothingness? Well, answering that question and unraveling the mystery of Landell's gate to nowhere will take us to some truly unexpected places and revelations.
Let's begin by examining the gate a bit further. As we mentioned, on the external side, it has the ornamentation of Peak Glendale, with Erdtree Sentinel equestrian statues and the characteristic Erdtree relief. On the internal side of the door, there is the aforementioned chasm, but if we look at the map and extend along a line of where the road should have led, interestingly enough, it leads to a unique part of the city. And here's where things get pretty interesting. In fact, you can see the continuation of the road with a new gate on the other side of the chasm, and it leads directly to a quarter of Landell that has the characteristic architectural features of what we'll call the Selian style, so named as it is best seen in Selia Town of Sorcery and its sister town, Ordina, liturgical town. We could catalog the similarities, okay, we will a little bit, from their conserved masonry, identical triangular gables, roof tiling, and even the leaden windows with characteristic pseudo-floral patterns. But honestly, if you just look at them side by side, you can see they're the same. These towns, Celia, Ordna, and Lower Landell, are the parochial equivalent to the Eternal Cities. For example, in Celia, we can see the giant crypt chair, seen in the below-ground Eternal Cities. We fight a Nox priest and swordstress as a boss, and we even see the giant silver spheres, characteristic of the Eternal Cities, just outside town. And in Ordina, the altars which hold statues of Mikola show the same notochord pattern seen on the giant crypt chairs of the Eternal Cities. So there is no doubt of the cultural continuity between these three towns and the Eternal Cities. What all of this appears to imply is that when the main gate of the city was functional, it led basically to an Eternal City outpost. This is odd, to say the least. Perhaps it's possible this little Selian town within Landell is just an immigrant exclave, where the remnant of the Old Order would live and work amongst the newly dominant Golden Order. But if we look deep beneath the chasm, through the abyss, we can glimpse the truth. This bizarre abyss within the inner walls of Landell is exactly above the nameless Eternal City, so much so that it actually appears to complete the missing part of the remaining city. The implication of this is clear, and here we have a startling revelation. When the nameless Eternal City was built, and before it was destroyed and sent underground, it was the missing part of Landell. We might call it the Lower Capital, or as its inhabitants might have called it, Landell Eternal City. This Eternal City of Landell truly has seen it all. When it was built, its main gate led to the lower, original city, now ruined underground, replete with Eternal City buildings and structures. At some point, the Divine Tower Bridge and Colosseum, followed by the Fortified Manor, were built, a topic we will discuss at length in the following episodes. And finally, the peak architecture of America's Golden Age was added, including the Yard Tree Sanctuary, the Queen's Bedchamber, and the upper half of the city. It is no coincidence that even in Landell's upper half, we find the same bizarre leaden windows characteristic of the Eternal Cities, albeit with a different pattern, the one found in Lower Landell and Celia. Just like in the real-world Eternal City, Rome, the ancient and the modern commingle, and Landell owes much to its origin as an Eternal City. The astute viewer will probably already by now have a nagging question, because, well, we've actually already seen this city before. It's in the opening cutscene, depicting a scene from the Shattering War, with soldiers marching against the gate, siege weapons in tow, and defensive projectiles raining down on the attackers. It's a beautiful and haunting scene, a once great city besieged, fallen to internecine strife. But now that we know where that road and gate actually led to, it has a very different implication. There would be no point in attacking the gate as it is, leading to an abyss, nor would there be any point, frankly, in defending it. Indeed, today it is completely undefended. In other words, this scene can help us date the banishment underground of the nameless Eternal City. 
it must have happened after the outbreak of the Shattering War, far later than usually assumed. We'll leave the full implications of this revelation for the upcoming episodes, but for now, we'll leave it at this. When Godwin the Golden was murdered during the Night of the Black Knives, the nameless Eternal City, the same one in which his undead corpse now festers, sat above ground, inside the walls of Landell. When Rajir says, They say the assassins who carried out the deed were scions of the Eternal City. That means something quite different now that we know that there was an Eternal City within the walls of Landell. Let us now walk through the various implications and possibilities from this initial analysis. First of all, we have the above-ground remnant of a structure, the Selian Quarter of Landell, and the giant road to nowhere leading up to it, that reside in the overworld in a matching location to the banished missing component, a kind of vertical superposition. In other words, the nameless Eternal City resides exactly below where it used to exist, not only does this have many fascinating implications for the Nameless Eternal City itself, but it also allows us to, if we extrapolate, deduce the original locations of the other Eternal Cities, before they were banished underground. Let's apply this notion to Noxtella first to see if it fits. These days, Noxtella is of course in the Netherworld, but if we superimpose its location onto the overworld map, it quite nicely fits. Already in the overworld, we can see above Noxtella and the Ul Palace ruins, the same ancient dynasty ruins in the overworld, what is today called the Ruined Labyrinth. These broken statues of the ancient dynast are likely all that is left after the cataclysmic force that moved the ground itself and took the Eternal Cities underground. Lyurnia has plenty of remnants of the Eternal City culture left, for example, the Nox Priestess statue in the Church of Vows, which we'll address in the coming episodes. But for now, it suffices to say that there was a time when both the Nameless Eternal City, aka Landell, and Noxtella were above ground, exactly above the locations where they now reside. And if we follow the road that emanates from Landell's Gate to Nowhere, with the one terminus at Landell, where does it lead? We'll have a lot to say about this road and its distinctive radially symmetric Elden Ring in future episodes, but for now we can just follow it along its path given the distinctive tiles, wider base, and drainage system. Sure enough, this grand highway runs straight through exactly where Noxtella would still be, were it not vanished underground. Like the Via Ignatia, which connected the twin capitals of the Roman Empire, Rome and Constantinople, here we have the Grand Highway connecting the twin cities of the Eternal Empire, Noxtella and Landell. We won't belabor the point too much, but if we apply this method again to Nokron, it is clear that Nokron as well existed above ground exactly where it now resides, as evidenced by the fact that Celia, town of sorcery, remains above ground in this location still. And of course, a road with the same radially symmetric Elden Ring connects this location as well. Credit to Nameless Singer on Reddit for first mapping out this road system. Such was the reach of the Eternal Empire at its peak. We should point out though that this Eternal City stratum is not homogeneous. If we compare the modern day Nameless Eternal City to the other two Eternal Cities, we can see it's quite distinct. The architecture is the same, true, indicating some continuity up to the point when the Eternal Cities were separated. But the Nameless Eternal City has no teeming masses embedded into the architecture, unlike the other two Eternal Cities. It also does not have the false night sky that the other two have, which, according to the documentary evidence, is a consequence of the Nox invoking the ire of the Greater Will. As attested to by the Nox Swordstress armor, which reads, quote, Long ago, the Nox invoked the ire of the Greater Will and were banished deep underground. Now they live under a false night sky. End quote. But there are no Nox in the Nameless Eternal City, only various fauna in the half formed gargoyles, which are made from the reused corpses of champions. 
and sealed together with corpse wax. As a minor aside, it is this corpse wax, which is a real phenomenon by the way, that explains the milky appearance of the water throughout the nameless eternal city and deep root depths. When decomposing bodies are exposed to water, say in a flooded tomb or a boat burial, the corpse wax, which is fat, undergoes a process which is generically known as saponification. The fat undergoes hydrolysis and becomes basically soap with a milky white color. This is so reliable that stories are told of people who have washed their clothes in rivers downstream of charnel grounds without knowing why washing their clothes in this specific spot caused their clothes to get so clean. Of course, they didn't know the origin of this natural soap. Anyway, returning to the point, clearly whatever catastrophe befell the nameless eternal city, as its structures are ruined, it has no false night sky, and is essentially completely uninhabited, is quite different from the catastrophe that befell the other two eternal cities. Let's keep these differences in mind as we piece together Godwin's story in the upcoming episodes. Like Xenophon unknowingly camping outside the ruins of Nineveh, the evidence of Landell's ancient past has been right under our noses, hiding in plain sight. As we've seen, there was a time in the lands between during which the Eternal Cities were the dominant political entity. The triplet cities connected by a great network of roads that stretched throughout the entire lands between, with special emphasis and dedication on the section connecting the nameless Eternal City, aka Landell, to Noxtella. In the past episodes, we've promised we'd explore the Saint and Tree Empire, and we haven't forgotten that promise. But this empire, the Eternal City Empire, is not it. The Eternal Cities have no tree iconography. In fact, they deliberately avoid interpretable designs. They have their own distinct set of statues, and save for a few special cases, there is no overlap with the same statues at all. So what gives? Well, from deep within this great empire that worshipped the stars and moon and adorned their buildings with inscrutable alien designs, a new faith was born. One born from an old prophecy and one that would transform this empire from within, forever altering the history of the lands between. And it is that new religion that will be the topic of our next episode.